uh, sleep problem is considered uh, as a problem that can potentially be treated and can have a diagnosis. We should also prevent diagnoses that are not consistent over time, consistent over time and only MSLT results change and not clinical complaints. And we should also develop more reliable guidelines how to exclude or how to treat sleep uh, insufficiency as explanation for daytime complaints of sleepiness. And of course, we want to be less strict, but we must objectify the complaint and we must objectify that we're dealing with sleep. Okay, and we also are convinced that when we implement this approach that we will have much better chances to identify biomarkers for other diagnoses than narcolepsy with catabolic zero MT1. Uh, so in a schedule, what to do? If there is a patient with a complaint of daytime sleepiness, this is the central complaint. When there is typical cataplexy, then it must be narcolepsy level one. Um, of course, it must be objectified, but well, if you have typical cataplexy, it will hardly ever be another diagnosis. But if there is no typical cataplexy, then if it's in a increased need for sleep, okay, then it could still be uh, let's say a naturally long sleeper so you need to exclude that that will be the cause but then again sleep extension would solve the daytime problem if it doesn't solve the daytime problem you in some cases may need to exclude sleep apnea as cause but if you objectify there is indeed an increased amount of sleep and there is no sleep apnea then call it idiopathic hypersomnia then the other part if there is an inability to stay awake if there could be sleep, dep sleep deprivation as cause, first <coughs> apply sleep extension. And only if the complaints remain after sleep extension, you may consider to exclude sleep apnea. And if it then still remains, then depending on the result of the MLCT and the polysomnography, it will be either narcolepsy, but a level two diagnosis, or a new category, which we call idiopathic EDS. So what will be the criteria of our proposed classification? Well, for narcolepsy type one, there is not much of a difference. The difference is that there may be either a short sleep latency or more than one sleep onset REM period. And the other main difference is that there is a level one, a definite diagnosis and a level two. So for the girl we were discussing this morning, she would already qualify because she had more than one SORM. But if she would have less than one serum, she could still qualify when she was refusing the hypercretin deficiency, the level two probable diagnosis. Then for the idiopathic hypersomnia, it's a bit more complex because the criteria are, are similar, but it's, it's in the details. There must be the presence of an excessive need for sleep. It must be acquired complaint and it must be objectified. And the difference between the two levels is the way it's objectified, and I will not go into detail over that. But the main difference with the current classification is also that we have a less strict uh, criterion, so not 11 hours, but nine to 10 hours could already qualify if the other criteria are qualified for as well. Then the final category, which we suggest to call idiopathic excessive data, <coughs> sleepiness, there is a level one diagnosis when the MSLT is less than eight minutes. And again, it is after exclusion of sleep deprivation also. And there are other probable categories when the MSLT is between eight and 12 minutes. And then we make a separation in the phenotype that is mainly characterized by attention problems, mainly characterized by non-REM uh, pathology or mainly characterized by REM pathology. Okay, then this is my last slide to summary. I hope to have convinced you that history taking, if it reveals a serious hypersomnolence problem and sleep deprivation, and also as cause are excluded, that in fact treatment is warranted, even if it does not fit the current RCD criteria, but preferably if it would fit our suggested alternative. And further advantages might be of this classification that we will much better chances to identify new biomarkers for the other 
causes of excess rotate and sleepiness. And it will also have the <coughs> properties that it's easy to move from one to another category, but only if clinical situation, clinical complaints also change. I want to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Agat Jan. That was an excellent talk. And I think for me, very much highlights the tension between research and the utility of diagnostic criteria for research in order to refine a particular condition versus clinical practice, which is about treating the patient in front of us. Um, I, I think we, we've got a, a few questions. In fact, I think I may have just paraphrased something that Angus Nisbet has asked, which is criteria are primarily for research and only a helpful guide to use in clinical practice. There are a couple of more specific questions. So can you recommend useful screening tools for hypersomnolence or a similar question is there a generic screening tool for hypersomnolence disorders yeah well I'm, I'm let's say a bit old-fashioned so i think history taking is, is still the domain uh, tool but but uh, i think that the except the effort sleepiness skill was also presented uh, for the the second uh, case uh, is really helpful in uh, in case of doubt but you always have to realize it doesn't make any difference between, let's say, lifestyle problems or uh, any diagnosis. For sure, you know it, that the mean score is higher in narcolepsy when compared to iodine. But it's not a diagnosis in itself. It's just support to identify sleepiness or to separate sleepiness from fatigue. I didn't stress that because that's difficult sometimes as well to separate sleepiness from fatigue. And we are talking about sleep disorders or about sleepiness. Right? Yeah, I wonder if that's just worth expanding on. Because there's another question here, which is, is chronic fatigue syndrome a disorder of hypersomnolence? And I think the answer to that no, is I think, fairly clear. I mean, the short answer is no. If you can say much more, and of, of course there can be overlap, but, but, but the, the, the short answer is no. These are really separate entities. Hmm? Uh, there's a, a, a question from Adrian Williams. Uh, unexplained weight gain was mentioned in case one and is of course accepted as part of narcolepsy but in separate situations is obesity itself associated with excessive sleepiness and not due to osa no as far as we know that's an interesting question as far as we know it's it's typically associated with narcolepsy and probably because it's associated with hypercretin deficiency that is although we don't understand the exact mechanisms but there are many studies who really show that that's a real association only exist with uh, hypercretin deficiency. So already type two uh, narcolepsy which is not associated with hypercretin uh, deficiency, there you don't see the, the association and in the idiopathic hypersomnia you also don't see it as well. Um, and, and perhaps one, one final question before we run out of time. Um, Mohamed Amir rather uh, asks, would you suggest stimulants for idiopathic EDS? Yeah, again, the, the short answer is, is, is yes. Well, but we, we are, and there are a lot of, and, and probably we'll hear more about it, there are a lot of substances uh, came fairly well more recently, but in general, I think the stimulants are, are, well, could be or should be the first uh, step when, when starting uh, pharmacological treatment. Yes. Great. Well, thank you very much, Gerdian. That was fantastic. Thank you. Well, then I'm happy to, to introduce my, my co-chair, uh, um, Professor Leschner. He's a consultant neurologist and clinical lead for the Sleep Disorder Center Kreis in uh, St. Thomas. He completed his medical school at Oxford uh, and Imperial College and a PhD in genetics of epilepsy and drug management at Imperial College and Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, Cambridge. After his neurology training in Kreis and St. Thomas in Charing Cross Hospital, at the National Hospital for Neurology and Research, he, he joined Christ in St. Thomas as a consultant. And he lectures regularly and has ongoing research interest in narcolepsy, epilepsy, sleepwalking, Klein Leffen syndrome, and restless leg syndrome. And the topic of today will be pathophysiology of hypersomnias with a special focus on advances in our understanding. So please, Guy, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you very much. Um, so can you, I just check that you can see my yes. slides? Great. So um, just before I start, uh, declarations, nothing that um, is a, a conflict of interest. Um, I'm going to be 
spending the next few minutes talking about what has changed in terms of our understanding of the pathophysiology of these groups of conditions that we term the central disorders of hypersomnolence. Now, you'll already have seen uh, from Gert Jan uh, these diagnostic categories at the moment. Within ICSD3, there are eight different central disorders of hypersomnolence, um, including the what, what we would consider uh, neurological causes, but then there are also those hypersomnias that are related to either a, an underlying medical condition, uh, those associated with a, a medication or substance, essentially iatrogenic or, 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 or self uh, iatrogenic um, causes of hypersomnia, those associated with a psychiatric condition, and then of course, perhaps the, the most common uh, uh, disorder of hypersomnolence, which is insufficient sleep syndrome. For the purpose of, the, uh, of this talk, however, I'm going to focus very much on the, uh, the neurological causes, the neurological disorders, uh, that is narcolepsy type 1, narcolepsy type 2, idiopathic hypersomnia, and Klein-Levin syndrome. Now, Gert Jan has already um, very eloquently talked about some of the issues uh, related to making these diagnoses, but particularly when it comes to understanding the underlying pathophysiology of these disorders, there are very important issues of phenotyping. And therefore, I, I, I mentioned briefly at the end of Gert Jan's talk that there remains this tension between diagnostic criteria for research purposes and a diagnostic criteria for clinical purposes. In fact, some people might say that diagnostic criteria in a clinical setting are, are unhelpful, whereas in research, obviously, in order to understand the pathophysiology of a disorder, you need to ensure that the cohort that you're studying is as uh, pure as possible. And the reality is that in our, the current way that we uh, practice uh, sleep medicine and in terms of the um, implications for the research, there remains significant overlap between these diagnostic categories. And this results in significant diagnostic confusion and um, a heterogeneous group of patients within one diagnostic category. Now, in clinical practice, obviously, that is less important because you're treating the patient in front of you, regardless of what the label is that you've given them. But in a research context, that has significant implications in, it, in that it dilutes your power to be able to understand the underlying pathophysiological process that is causing a particular disorder. And Jan has already very eloquently demonstrated the limitations of relying upon um, biological tests like the MSLT to label one individual as having idiopathic hypersomnia and another individual as having narcolepsy type 2. This is a, a now a rather an old study from um, uh, um, Trotti et al. in, I think it was 2013, which demonstrated the huge intra- uh, individual uh, reliability or lack of reliability in the MSLT, demonstrating very significant changes both in the mean sleep latency and the number of sleep onset REM periods between a first MSLT and a second MSLT. And this uh, very clearly illustrates that depending on which MSLT you took for any individual, their diagnostic category changed significantly. This is another study here from Marty et al, which showed that a very uh, significant proportion of patients with what was at that time called behaviorally induced insufficient sleep syndrome demonstrated SOREMs within the MSLT. So relying on, on this test to uh, very strictly um, define your patient group uh, is intrinsically rather dangerous. So. In terms of our understanding of the pathophysiology of, of these disorders, perhaps the greatest success, unsurprisingly, is in narcolepsy type 1, because we have the presence of cataplexy, which is essentially pathognomonic in narcolepsy type 1, to define a very tight cohort. Obviously, there are going to be individuals around the edges, individuals like uh, the young girl that Jan demonstrated. And in fact, we've seen multiple patients uh, who have perhaps not initially fitted a diagnosis of narcolepsy type 1 and then subsequently did. But in terms of a 
a very carefully defined group, uh, this is about as good as you can get the presence of cataplexy. And this has allowed us to identify two major changes in systems related to this condition. So we now understand that the immune system is very heavily involved in the pathophysiology of narcolepsy type 1. There is, of course, that uh, extremely strong HLA association with DQB1 star 0602, which is the strongest association of any condition with an HLA type and really very much points to there being an underlying autoimmune or immune mediated process. We uh, see seasonal fluctuations in the incidence of narcolepsy type 1 that seems to correlate with upper respiratory tract infections. And of course, more recently, um, there has been this very strong association, particularly with the uh, H1N1 swine flu pandemics vaccine, but also with the H1N1 uh, virus itself. We have further genetic evidence that points to an underlying immune mediated process in that whole genome association studies have demonstrated an association with variants in a, in a gene that encodes the T cell uh, receptor uh, alpha subunit um, with the development of narcolepsy type uh, one. And in addition, over the years, there have been various papers that have been published um, associating either the development of narcolepsy itself or the severity of cataplexy with various antibodies, notably uh, antibodies like uh, anti triple 2 analogue. We also have this uh, additional uh, data that uh, clearly demonstrates that at least for NT1, um, the hypocretin or orexin system is, is uh, certainly from a pathological perspective, the underlying problem. We have pathological evidence of the loss of, of these um, this small nucleus of, of cells within the lateral hypothalamus, which produces hypocretin being damaged and that 90% uh, or more of loss of these cells results in the clinical phenotype. Uh, and we now, of course, uh, don't uh, routinely do post-mortems, but CSF hypocretin deficiency is a readily um, easy um, diagnostic test in order to make the diagnosis. And from the canine model of narcolepsy uh, with cataplexy that was developed in, in, in Stanford, um, obviously mutations within hypocretin receptor genes were identified as being the underlying cause. Although interestingly, of course, almost never in, in humans. I'm only aware of, I think, two individuals who've been demonstrated to have a, a mutation in uh, the, the postsynaptic receptor gene. So, but one of the uh, underlying issues, at least until recently, has been how these two relate. So what, how does the immune system uh, really generate this uh, immune mediated damage to the hypocretin system? So we know that um, this um, uh, HLA type DQB1 star 0602 is a fundamentally important structure in the presentation of uh, antigens or uh, epitopes to CD4 uh, T cells. Um, and, and this DQB1 star 0602 is very strongly associated. 98% of individuals with NT1 have uh, this um, allele. But we also know that there are other HLA types within this um, complex here um, that also uh, uh, increase susceptibility or increased risk of developing narcolepsy. Um, interestingly, we also know that there are some variants in, in, in this uh, MHC, MHC class 1, which is involved in presenting epitopes to CD8 cells. So, you know, one of the things that remains unclear, although this very strong association, association with MHC uh, class 2 suggests that CD4 T cells might be responsible for autoimmune mediated attack. Uh, there is certainly a suggestion of an influence of uh, MHC class one as well. Um, but it's only really been recently because there have been historically a few, you know, at least uh, a few papers that have suggested that this might be an immune mediated antibody mediated response that we've begun to understand the relationship between T cells and the development of narcolepsy. And this was one of the first papers that came out a few years ago that identified within individuals with narcolepsy type one, 
a, a, a subpopulation of, of memory CD4 T cells that responded to uh, hypocretin producing neurons. And indeed, they also found uh, some populations of CD8 cells that were targeting these, these self antigens. And indeed, when they looked in individuals with narcolepsy type 2, these um, CD4 positive populations were also identified. Although, interestingly, one of those narcolepsy uh, NT2 patients then subsequently developed cataplexy. And indeed, subsequent studies, there have been a couple of further studies, uh, uh, one including uh, Emmanuel Migno's group, uh, which uh, demonstrated that it was not just CD4 cells, but actually CD8 cells as well, um, that seemed to um, be particularly programmed at recognizing uh, hypercretin or other antigens that were expressed by these neurons. So one of the big questions is, well, which of these populations of, of cells is it that's responsible for neuronal death? Well, as I've already shown you, for T cells to destroy specific neurons, it requires those, those cells to interact um, uh, through the MHC molecule. And um, whilst MHC class 1 mediates uh, CD8 uh, killer cell T cell uh, immune response, the MHC2, which is most strongly associated with narcolepsy, is really uh, the uh, molecular mechanism by which CD4 cells bind. Um, and one of the issues with this problem is that CD4 cells are generally not viewed to be causing cell death. They're not generally held to be cytotoxic. And so there remain some questions about how this MHC class 2 is responsible for triggering off this uh, immune mediated cell death death of the hypercretin neurons. It's very clear that CD8 cells can kill hypercretin neurons, and that's been proven using transgenic mice uh, that have been injected with CD8 cells, uh, which uh, clearly did demonstrate neuronal death of hypercretin producing neurons. Actually, when CD4 cells were injected, it caused a little bit of inflammation, but not cell death. And indeed, the Peterson study, which I, I talked about briefly earlier, demonstrated that um, uh, CD8 cells seem to uh, recognize uh, narcolepsy type 1 related proteins um, in, 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 in HLA positive individuals, but not HLA negative individuals. Now, what that perhaps tells us is that there's an in, important interaction between CD4 and CD8, and that actually the CD8 cells cause cell death, but require some sort of CD4 mediated mechanism to facilitate that. So can narcolepsy type one now be considered an immune disease? Well, I think we probably can. Uh, call it that, but there remain a number of unanswered or, or, or uncertain questions. The first is in, in, in real life, in humans, how common is it for autoreactive T cells to infiltrate the hypothalamus? Well, uh, that's really never been demonstrated apart from in one individual who developed a, uh, a, a, an autoimmune, a paraneoplastic encephalitis and had significant infiltration of, 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 of CD8 cells in, in uh, a condition that looks like uh, narcolepsy type 1, although cannot be uh, really uh, considered to be representative of NT1 in general. Can we precipitate narcolepsy type 1 by transferring T cells from one individual to another? And that's not yet been tested. And perhaps most importantly, from a clinical perspective, is if we are starting to understand the immune mediated mechanisms of cell death, can we modulate that? by utilizing immunomodulatory treatments? Can we either um, uh, modulate the severity or, or can we actually prevent um, subclinical damage turning into um, a, a clinical disease? And uh, certainly attempts so far have been largely unsuccessful. So, so certainly we've made sort of big inroads into understanding the pathophysiology of narcolepsy type one. But for narcolepsy type two, that is much more difficult. And this comes back to this issue of defining a phenotype from a research uh, perspective. Um, it's more difficult to diagnose. We don't have pathognomonic symptoms or indeed signs like cataplexy. We don't have particularly good biomarkers. The MSLT, as I've already said, is very unreliable. 
And so narcolepsy type two uh, remains a diagnosis of exclusion. And I think even as an entity remains widely debated as to what it actually constitutes. I, I think I would not be alone in saying that the proportion of patients that we see in a clinical context who we diagnose as having narcolepsy type two compared to narcolepsy type one it, it is probably not too dissimilar. But actually when this is looked at in, in great detail, it appears that true NT type two, uh, NT2, however you define it, is actually probably much rarer than narcolepsy type one. And that at least is suggested by this recent study from um, one of the Swiss groups, which looked at almost 4,000 patients that were passing through their center over an 18 year period, um, all of whom had um, uh, assessment and uh, MSLTs, they formally diagnosed in those 4,000 patients NT1 in 91. Um, uh, of all those patients, uh, an additional 171 had an MSLT that was diagnosed as, diagnosed as NT2. But by the end of their uh, evaluation, by the end of all their diagnostic testing and, and clinical assessments, six of those 171 were finally diagnosed with NT2. And indeed, two of those then went on to develop NT1. So really, essentially, over this 18 year period, they had 90, actually uh, 93 NT1s and four NT2s, really suggesting that um, at least the reality is somewhere between what we see in normal clinical practice and, and, and what was seen uh, within the study, suggesting that NT2 is significantly rarer than NT1. So what about idiopathic hypersomnia? Well, uh, as uh, Gert Jan um, uh, described, the diagnostic criteria for idiopathic hypersomnia has changed in, in recent iterations of, of diagnostic classifications. And, and hopefully, if uh, Gert Jan and his colleagues are successful, we'll change again. Um, as with NT2, it is unclear if it's a homogeneous or indeed a heterogeneous group of disorders. Uh, a study from a few years ago by Songkratal really uh, suggested that on the basis of a cluster analysis that there seemed to be two distinct patterns of idiopathic hypersomnia, one without long sleep time and, and one with long sleep time as previous iterations of diagnostic classifications uh, allowed for and what they demonstrated was there seemed to be a, a much closer relationship between NT2 and idiopathic hypersomnia without long sleep time whereas um, NT1 and IH with long sleep time perhaps may represent separate entities perhaps once again you know reinforcing the fact that this is probably not one condition but it's probably a, diff a group of conditions and indeed, very recently, I think in the last few months, uh, Sonka's group has also published an additional paper where they carefully phenotyped their IH patients and they showed that there, there were distinct clusters within these patients, including one cluster with much more severe hypersomnolence uh, associated with uh, significant depressive symptoms with uh, 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 higher levels of sleep inertia, um, longer sleep duration and greater functional impairment. And, and so, so at least uh, suggesting that we really do need to make more of an effort in terms of phenotyping these patients, at least to allow us to progress in terms of our understanding of these conditions. So what's the pathophysiology? Well, could idiopathic hypersomnia be a circadian rhythm disorder? There is some evidence to point to that in that patients with IH often have a tendency towards an evening chronotype and that IH patients will often describe being significantly more awake in the evenings than the mornings. There is also some overlap in terms of a clinical picture in that patients with delayed sleep phase syndrome, of course, may experience significant uh, sleep inertia and sleep drunkenness, as well as EDS, uh, largely due to the fact that their circadian rhythms are misaligned. But importantly, of course, in DSPS, when uh, they adjust their, their sleep patterns, uh, their symptoms resolve. And so certainly a circadian rhythm disorder in and of itself is unlikely to fully explain idiopathic hypersomnia. There is some further evidence, however, to point towards circadian rhythms being disrupted in IH in that studies of melatonin uh, secretion and indeed court morning cortisol demonstrate a shift 
in melatonin secretion by about two hours and a morning cortisol rise delay by about an hour. Uh, additionally, in those patients that were studied in that particular um, study, those individuals demonstrated a longer duration of the night phase. So it's suggesting that there may indeed be a contribution from some circadian abnormalities. And indeed, when dermal skin fibroblasts have been extracted from IH patients, uh, they have been demonstrated on the basis of immunofluorescence of expression of certain circadian genes, that their average period length is longer than normal controls. There's also the uh, story of uh, a possible genetic contribution in the family history is relatively common in IH patients and indeed some um, people have speculated that the major issue with idiopathic hypersomnia which clinically appears to be sleep inertia or, or drunkenness implies dysfunction of the arousal system and indeed subsequent brain imaging of, of regional blood flow has demonstrated changes within the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate cortex, which is reminiscent of non-REM sleep, suggesting some degree of overlap between the waking state in IH and aspects of non-REM sleep. Finally, I'm going to touch upon this story that came about uh, about 10 years ago, uh, largely driven by David Rye's group, uh, which uh, undertook some assessment of the CSF of patients with, with IH. And what they appeared to demonstrate uh, was the presence possibly of some endogenous sub substance within the CSF that uh, accentuated um, the GABA-mediated stimulation of GABA-A receptor function. And they demonstrate, appeared to demonstrate that when you add flumazenil to the uh, CSF of patients with IH that this reversed this enhancement of GABA-A function. On the basis of that, on the basis of the individuals who exhibited the, the most of this um, GABAergic uh, accentuation, they gave seven patients intravenous flumazenil and at least on measures of vigilance, they demonstrated a significant improvement and went on to describe one patient who was treat treated for four years using sublingual and transdermal preparations of flumazenil um, that uh, continued to obtain benefit. And indeed, they then went on to perform uh, to, to report a, a retrospective case review of 153 patients describing benefits from flumazenil in about two thirds of patients, although really importantly, there were really no objective markers. And indeed, there have been a few other attempts to replicate those CSF findings, um, in particular this study by Yves de Villiers, um, in, in whom the, the original finding of this CSF uh, augmentation of GABAergic function uh, has not been demonstrated. So this remains still somewhat controversial, and I think it, it, the lack of replication is, is of concern. And then very finally, I'm going to talk about what we've learned about Klein-Levin syndrome in recent years. So most of you will be familiar with this condition that often affects young individuals, episodic hypersomnia associated with behavioral change, uh, some uh, psychiatric uh, features, uh, things like megaphagia and occasionally hypersexuality. Uh, it remains essentially still largely a mystery, although there have been some steps forward from a genetic perspective. In, the, in 2019, Al-Sharif et al. Um, studied a very large uh, Saudi family, a uh, consanguineous uh, Saudi family, in uh, which there were eight patients who appeared to have KLS, at least based on diagnostic criteria. And they undertook some uh, linkage uh, analysis, some SNP genotyping, and subsequently some exome sequencing. And they identified this gene called LMOD3, a gene of unknown function, which uh, seemed to um, exhibit significant linkage, linkage analysis with the uh, phenotype. They went on to subsequently sequence that gene and they identified a missense variant that was present in all of those affected individuals. And when they looked at a, a cohort of European KLS patients, they identified the same variant in the same gene in one of those 38, but also found two other variants within that gene in three other cases. And so they speculated that this gene may be significantly implicated in the pathophysiology of Klein-Levin syndrome, quite sensibly. 
This gene has an unknown function. It's expressed very widely in mouse brain, including wake promoting neurons. So there is a sort of biologically plausible argument that can be built around this gene. Um, this study, which is really hot off the press, so when I made this slide a week ago, it was still in press yesterday, it was published. This is a very large international collaboration uh, that was coordinated out of Stanford, um, uh, whereby they uh, identified 673 KLS patients from around the world and performed whole genome uh, association studies, uh, comparing them against 15,000 normal controls. And what they identified was, and this is a Manhattan plot here of the individual SNPs and here of the of the genes themselves, that this gene, TRANK1, really was the only gene, both on a SNP basis, where there were 20 SNPs across the gene, but also on, on a gene-wide basis that reached statistical significance as being strongly associated with um, Klein-Levin syndrome and indeed they then went on to replicate uh, this finding in uh, a further cohort of 171 individual cases. Now why is this uh, of interest? Well TRANK1 has previously been associated with conditions like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and this is of really particular interest given both the clinical and the therapeutic overlap with bipolar disorder Obviously, bipolar disorder is characterized by marked swings in terms of sleep patterns and like Klein-Levin syndrome is also responsive to lithium. Um, there remains an unclear answer as to why this gene might be associated with, with, bi with uh, Klein-Levin syndrome, but certainly it, what was found in this cohort is that TRANK1 was strongly associated with birth difficulties. And so it was speculated that either variants within this gene might modulate a response to brain injury or, or may actually predispose to, to, to birth injury or brain-related birth injury in the first place. And indeed, TRANK1 is expressed in placental tissue at very high levels. What, what was additionally interesting about this study is that it failed to identify any variants in LMOD3 within this, um, you know, seven or 800 uh, individuals with Klein-Levin syndrome. So I think the LMOD3 story remains unresolved. So in summary, I think we've made huge inroads into understanding the pathophysiology of at least one of the central hypersomnias that we see in recent years. Obviously, there is a reason for that in the NT1 represents a much purer phenotype. There still remains significant uncertainty as to what NT2 and idiopathic hypersomnia really represent. And careful phenotyping is really uh, crucial to furthering our efforts to understand etiology. But, you know, as Gert Jan says, this careful phenotyping may not help treat the individual sitting in front of us, at least immediately in the clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Guy, for this very clear, comprehensive, up-to-date overview. Um, it looks like you have been very convincing because I see only one question. Or I've bored them into submission. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me... Uh, it's more a remark than a question uh, about rhythms in, in many disorders. So it's not too surprising that you can find them in the disorders you discussed. Um, well, maybe I, because we're also running out of time, can have one question, a very practical question, because in my practice, but it's probably the same in yours, many um, people, not only patients, call uh, because they are worried about the vaccination for COVID-19. Could there be a relation with narcolepsy or the development of narcolepsy because of this story of the pandemic's uh, vaccination? Yeah, well, um, I, 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 I know what I'm telling my patients, which is that, um, um, you know, of course, there is a theoretical risk with every um, epitope that you're exposed to, but we have no particular signal at the moment that either um, COVID-19 or indeed the vaccines are associated with um, the development of narcolepsy um, and uh, you know given that the risks of developing um, significant complications with COVID-19 and indeed death uh, if you're not very young are not insignificant they pr are probably substantially higher uh, than any risk associated with the vaccine so at the moment we're telling all our patients to proceed with vaccination if they have any susceptibility.
I fully agree. We, we have about the same story. Yeah. Well, I don't see any further questions, but okay, that, that implicates that we can keep our time schedule. Thank you once again, Guy. Great, and I um, think it, it falls to me to introduce Jazz. Uh, so Jazz Vinder um, uh, uh, is um, our um, one of our uh, senior clinical pharmacists in the um, in the sleep centre. So over the last few years, uh, we've really um, identified the the enormous help that pharmacists give in terms of managing our patients and indeed really taking forward some of the development of pathways for uh, new drugs. So um, Jazz's current role really encompasses a very wide remit within our service. He's running pharmacist-led outpatient clinics for uh, patients with sleep disorders uh, and is also uh, developing pathways for, for sleep medicines and um, applications and development of, uh, of formularies, uh, formulary applications, uh, also getting... Um, uh, agreement from CCGs to allow us to utilize uh, new uh, drugs and uh, he has now got actually quite significant expertise in, in, in utilizing some of these drugs that have been relatively new in terms of uh, where they've appeared on the marketplace so he's going to be talking to us about new developments in therapeutics in the central hypersomnias. Thanks Jazz. Thank you very much, Guy, uh, for that very kind introduction, and thanks for uh, Jörg and the co-organisers for the inv kind invitation. Right, let's share my screen first of all. Is that being shared? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to provide a um, a brief snapshot of the um, further uh, options that we have in terms of uh, of, of narcolepsy, and um, and in terms of. Yeah, sorry, you may you may want to hide presenter view because at the moment we can see your next slide. So. Ah. Okay. Let's take a look. Oops. So if you click the three the three buttons just underneath your big. Uh, um. Let's take a look. How do I? So so just click click on presenter view now. So so start slideshow. Yeah. And oh, we're these, the you, settings. You, you, yeah, that's, that's, it. that's it. it. Perfect. Perfect. Apologies, everyone. Thanks, Guy. Okay. So. Okay. So the, the question is that, you know, why do we need further options? Um, when we have good enough uh, conventional treatments at the moment. Um, but of course, we, we know we don't because we know that some patients can't tolerate conventional medications. Um, and of course, some patients have, or although many patients have, um, initially or gradually become refractory to these agents. And of course, there's comorbidities and contraindications as well as drug interactions they, that might preclude um, the use of uh, such agents. And as Guy has eloquently alluded to, there, there is an um, autoimmune component to this. So we're not actually curing the condition. All we're doing is treating the symptoms. Okay, so I'm just going to take you over uh, during this talk, a brief overview um, and a snapshot of the approved as well as investigational agents that are currently in development for narcolepsy and are very in various different stages of development. So as I describe the agents, I'll very briefly run over a snapshot of their, um, uh, their mechanism of action, underpinning evidence, and their, importantly, their potential place in therapy and how we're going to be using this in clinical practice, potentially. So first off, I'm sure you're aware of Pitolicin, um, and in terms of its um, uh, mechanism of action, it is a H2 receptor antagonist. Um, it's got a, a a very novel mechanism of action. 
that's uh, unshared by any other medication currently on the, on the market, and it's licensed for um, adults with narcolepsy with or without catapleptic. Um, Okay, so coming on to the, the HARMONY study, so I'm sure you're aware of the underpinning of evidence, but just as a, a brief overview. So uh, HARMONY 1 was a phase 3 trial for uh, patolicin in adults with narcolepsy, with or without catapleptic, with modafinil as an active comparator. So uh, it's crucial, uh, crucial point of note was that stimulants were not permitted in, for at least 14 days before the trial. Um, and anticatapleptic medications actually uh, could be continued um, at a stable dose. So what they found was that uh, the tolicin was superior to placebo, significantly superior. Um, however, it was non-inferior. It was found not to be non-inferior to uh, modafinil. And coming on to cataplexy, uh, so looking at the cataplexy perspective uh, for tolicin, um, the phase three trial of the harmony CTP um, was in trial uh, was a trial in adults with narcolepsy with at least three cataplexy episodes per week. So um, after a two week baseline period, participants were randomized to patolicin or placebo. Treatment lasted for uh, seven weeks, consisting of three weeks of flexible dosing, uh, decided by the investigators according to the efficacy and tolerance, followed by four weeks of stable dosing. So what they found was that the Importantly, the weekly cataplexy uh, rate um, was significantly reduced in uh, the majority of patients. And there were secondary uh, uh, outcome improvements in the form of reduction of uh, sleeping score and the mean wakefulness test. So this, the leading on to the Harmony 3 study. So this is a long-term study for Patolison looking at the safety and efficacy element. So this was an open label study actually, and it was a pragmatic real life study looking at adult patients with narcolepsy and an Epworth score of at least 12. Um, a total of 102 patients um, received pitocin. Um, and most importantly, most discontinuous occur, uh, discontinuations occurred during the first three months. Um, the most common reasons for discontinuation were perceived in, uh, insufficient efficacy and adverse, effect, uh, adverse events. So what they found uh, was that complete and partial cataplexy hallucinations and the REM intrusion phenomenon such as uh, sleep paralysis um, were reduced um, significantly in each of those uh, cohorts respectively. So um, at Gaia's uh, Sleep Center, we've, um, my colleagues and I uh, carried out this uh, recent um, analysis of, which is a pragmatic real life perspective study um, at our sleep center. The premise of this was that really very little is known about the utility of patillocin therapy in patients whose symptoms remain refractory to conventional stimulant therapy. In other words, these, uh, this uh, study was carried out in patients that were uh, already taking um, stimulant therapy and their symptoms were refractory uh, to, to those therapies. So patients um, with objectively confirmed central hypersomnia who had persistent EDS uh, despite use of at least two wakefulness promoting agents were commenced on patolicin via a pharmacist led clinic. So we prospectively recorded the Epworth score, the, uh, the Pittsburgh sleep quality index and the quality of life uh, scales and the, the rate of cataplexy um, as, as well as other REM intrusion from the such as hallucination um, and um, sleep paralysis rates um, at initiation and at 12 weeks um, of reaching patolicin um, target dose. So of the 86 patients, including the study, 68 patients were given patolicin. The remaining uh, patients were, um, were referred for MDM input for either uh, further analysis um, or for further investigations. So what do we find at 12 weeks? Well, um, the, we found that the sleepiness score significantly reduced um, as well as the uh, there was re significant reductions in the sleep quality um, uh, index um, and also improvements in the sleep quality. Uh, there were reductions in, um, uh, sorry, there was improvement in cataplexy um, as well as reduced symptoms. 
Um, there was also a reduction in the REM intrusion phenomenon, uh, such as sleep paralysis and hypnagogic hallucinations compared to baseline. And really importantly, I, I think this point is worth stressing. So um, we often uh, treat patients uh, with conventional treatments and they have already started on uh, a pre-existing conventional treatment uh, prior to that. So for example, we might start a patient on the Daphne, um, and then further along the line, we might add on uh, psychostimulants such as methylphenidate or dexamphetamine. So I think uh, with this point, um, we, uh, we eloquently showed, although there is obviously much more research in this area to be done, um, that adding on patolicin reduces the need, and in some cases actually um, stopped um, uh, the need for patients actually uh, on these uh, concomitant medications. So we found there were significant dose reductions of modafinil, uh, patients taking uh, concomitant modafinil, methylphenidate or dexamphetamine, which I think is an important point going forwards um, because of not only patolicin by in its own right uh, demonstrating efficacy, but also by taking less stimulants, uh, we're also exposing the patients to less potential side effects going forwards. So it's placed in therapy. Well, the lack of effect of doping release in the nuclear accumbens um, means patolicin often a really a novel mechanism of action, uh, which I alluded to before with the H2 receptor system. Um, and it largely differentiates, differentiates itself from other weight promoting agents. It also has a favorable um, adverse drug reaction and tolerability profile, which further supports its utility. And there are potential, although there are potential drug inter interactions with common uh, you know, SNRIs and SSRIs that may require dose adjustment. Um, overall, in, in practice, from what we see, there are uh, in, in clinical practice, um, these interactions um, really raise um, uh, an issue. Although with comorbid issues such as renal impairment, um, and of course, if there are comorbid indications such as hypertension, then we then we would need to consider those reductions or dose uh, amendments in, in those cases. Of course, cost is and local commissioning is an important point and that might influence its, uh, at which step we use that in the, in the ladder. The next agent uh, I'll uh, go over is sulfonyl, which again, I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, so this is a weight promoting agent and it's, um, it's largely thought of, um, I think it's uh, largely accepted that it's, uh, its mechanism of action is largely attributable to its actions at the dopamine and noradrenaline transporters and um, inhibiting reuptake. So going on to the, um, the underlying evidence, so very briefly on to the TONES study. So TONES, for those of you um, not aware, so TONES was a, a collective program, it actually abbreviates for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea and narcolepsy, uh, excessive sleepiness. Um, it's a phase three, uh, it was a phase three uh, program. Um, so it looked at uh, both the safety and efficacy of sulfur and fatal in patients without, uh, with or without uh, cataplexy and those with narcolepsy. It ran over 12 weeks versus placebo. And I think this is an important point because um, compared to pitolicin, there, there, was, there was no compar active comparator here, it was compared to placebo. Um, in terms of its primary endpoint, um, there were, uh, they were measuring changes from baseline in uh, MWT and the Edwards score. And what they found was that sulfur inventory was associated with greater improvement than placebo in both metrics um, and, and at both doses. Um, Unfortunately, there was no clear effect um, of sulfur on the number of weekly cataplexy attacks. But again, it, it could be argued looking at the study as a whole, uh, taking a step back, uh, it could be argued that the study wasn't really designed or powered to evaluate cataplexy events to begin with. In terms of long-term efficacy, so very similar to the Patolson um, uh, study, they, uh, the study investigators looked at long-term efficacy of sulfur amphetol. Um, so this was a long-term open label uh, studied by Maholtra and colleagues. They evaluated the safety and ma maintenance of efficacy of sulfur amphetol participants with narcolepsy. And this was done over a, a two-week randomized uh, withdrawal phase after six months. Um, the randomized withdrawal phase provides, uh, is important because it provides evidence that improvements observed in the study are not simply related to changes that might have occurred over time, for example, resolution of symptoms uh, with time. Uh, 
and that the beneficial effects observed with sulfur and Vitol are not likely to be related to placebo. So I think that's sort of that they did well into in terms of incorporating incorporating that into the methodology. Um, the inclusion of the randomized withdrawal phase was important as it provided further support for the maintenance of efficacy of uh, sulfur and Vitol by demonstrating that discontinuation of treatment resulting uh, resulted in worsening on the EFLA score and the global improvement scales overall. So what they found in the studies um, was that sulfur and was associated with significant uh, improvements in these, um, in these aforementioned uh, metrics. So place in therapy. Okay, so just coming back to what I was mentioned before, there are no head-to-head -head trials um, with sulfur and and an active comparator compared with, uh, with the uh, harmony studies with modafinil versus patolicin. So it, it's difficult to assign um, accurately where its place in therapy will be. And of course, there's cost implications as well, as well as that NICE are currently in the process of uh, publishing their technical analysis on and uh, a technical appraisal on uh, sulfur and fatol. So this could uh, likely mean that its most likely use is to be used after the conventional uh, treatments that we have at the moment. So after modafinil, dexamphetamine, and methylphenidate. But of course, um, you know, that, that with such patients that, that are being proposed uh, such a new treatment, such as patolicin and, and indeed sulfur and fatal, uh, such treatments will be, you know, such patients will be identified for selection by the uh, overarching consultant and then discuss the MDM for further uh, discussion there. Now on to um, the final approved uh, drug that, that I'll uh, look over and I'll uh, discuss. Um, so this is Zywave. It's a, it's a novel sodium oxalate preparation. So of course we use sodium oxalate on our treatment ladder for narcolepsy and particularly for treating cataplexy perspective of, of narcolepsy type one patients. Um, so it is, it's, it's important um, to point out that it actually contains far less sodium than, uh, than the um, existing sodium oxalate that we use. Um, it's also shown in phase three um, studies versus placebo um, that it's, uh, it's um, demonstrated significant improvements in cataplexy and excessive daytime sleepiness. And its actual safety profile, as you, uh, one, was, one would expect, is consistent with sodium oxalate. Now, why, why would this drug be um, uh, a valuable addition, uh, potential addition to a pathway? Um, well, simply put, that there are certain treatments, um, uh, certain subset of patients, sorry, um, that we would use sodium oxalate or rather not use sodium oxalate in simply because of comorbidities. For example, those with hypertension, heart failure, or renal impairment. So, of course, these are patients um, that are particularly sensitive to sodium and um, are, are likely to have blood pressure increases as a result. And, and also, uh, there's uh, having a le uh, reduced sodium content, uh, there's, it's less likely to cause fluid accumulation and swelling. But again, particularly important with these, with those patients with significant renal impairment and particularly those with heart failure. Furthermore, it might be better tolerated. So we see many patients that uh, in practice that uh, cannot tolerate sodium oxalate simply because of the high sodium content uh, that it produces an unpleasant taste and also related to uh, relevant GI effects as well. So it's coming on to the investigational drugs now. So this is FT218. Um, it's, it's a controlled release of sodium oxalate that's currently being investigated um, as part of the REST ON study. So that stands for the randomized study evaluating the efficacy and safety of a once nightly uh, formulation of sodium oxalate. So um, the uh, primary analysis result from um, April 2010 uh, were released and it showed similar effects uh, for the lower doses, meaning less side effects and, and improved adherence. The, importantly, for, regarding the sleep metrics, um, the, they compared the nine gram dose of once nightly uh, F2218 compared to placebo over 13 weeks. And what they found across all dimensions of MWT, the uh, global impression scores, um, uh, the clinical global impression score, and the mean weekly cataplexy effects, um, they, there were significant improvements for all endpoints. Um, and compared to the uh, sodium oxalate, uh, the regular release, it was well tolerated. And, um, and the most commonly known uh, adverse effects um, were similar to those with the, the regular sodium oxalate that we use. Uh, 
And uh, the studies uh, are now looking at the six gram um, and the 7.5 grams as well uh, in terms of uh, efficacy and safety. And also the early results is that there, there are similar efficacy effects at both uh, these doses, um, which is important because some patients cannot tolerate the higher dose of um, sodium oxalate. Uh, so it's important to demonstrate an appreciable eff efficacious effect at lower doses for such patients. Um, so for the, there's another study that's actually uh, currently in process, and that's the open label study called Restore. And it's a long-term study over two years with F2, FT218 in subjects with narcolepsy um, with, with cataplexy, and that's currently in, in recruitment. So very briefly, um, this is the pharmacokinetic profile uh, that is found by um, uh, Dr. Thorpe and colleagues. Um, and they, they demonstrated quite eloquently that there was a, a less uh, of a peak uh, concentration in the plasma compared to uh, the usual conventional um, sodium oxalate dose. And this was related to uh, reduced um, uh, side effects of the, um, of the sodium oxalate um, being used. So in terms of place in therapy, well, the one slightly dosing uh, with FT218 offers uh, you know, obvious, uh, an obvious potential advantage over the conventional twice nightly dosing. For many patients, twice nightly dosing is really problematic and affects adherence. Um, it is a very effective drug, sodium oxalate, but what it does in terms of reducing REM intrusion phenomenon and cataplexy and subsequent days daytime sleepiness. However, uh, for, you know, uh, where patients have adherence problems uh, and highly likely at the beginning of therapy when we initiate, they find it difficult to adjust to the twice nightly uh, treatment. Um, the lower uh, CMAX, as we can see in the graph, the lower uh, P concentrations compared to that of immediate release may also confer improved uh, tolerability going forwards as well. And, and both of these um, elements uh, that I just mentioned um, could actually um, pave a way for potentially replacing the current version of sodium oxalate going forwards. On to the second investigational therapy. So this is uh, TAC925. So as Guy very eloquently um, demonstrated in his talk, there is an autoimmune uh, component um, to uh, type 1 narcolepsy. Um, so as we know, nar uh, narcolepsy type 1 is caused by a loss of orexin producing neurons. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, the current medications for narcolepsy usually produce good, but often partial improvements in the symptoms. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're just treating the symptoms. They're not treating the underlying cause. So this could change with, with TAC 925 and similar um, orexin agonists. So uh, TAC 295 is really the first orexin agonist uh, to be tested in, in patients with uh, narcolepsy type one. So uh, data presented at the World Sleep Congress, um, uh, this is from an early proof of concept study. Um, it demonstrated a single intravenous administration of TAC95 um, in patients with uh, type one narcolepsy. It demonstrated a, um, on the mean sleep latency on the 40 minute uh, MWT was 22.4, 37.6 and 40 minutes. Um, at 5, 11, 45 milligram dose respectively, compared with 2.1, uh, uh, sorry, 2.9 uh, minutes with placebo. So a significant improvement there compared to placebo in those metrics. The score on the Karolinska sleeping scale also was significantly lower with all those uh, mentioned doses of TAC95 uh, compared to placebo. Uh, currently the Sparkle study um, is currently uh, recruiting. Um, so this is an oral form of uh, TAC95. Um, and uh, previously it's shown uh, in two mouse models of narcolepsy of incre increasing uh, wakefulness during the active phase and um, suppressing uh, cataplexy-like episodes. And, and in, in terms of place and therapy, I, I think the oral um, therapy um, has particular um, uh, weight attached to it. Um, the IV possibly less so, but then in terms of proof and concept going forward in terms of erecting uh, uh, agonist uh, efficacy demonstrating that, I think both are highly valuable in, in giving us much more information in terms of the underlying, treating the underlying causes of, of type one narcolepsy. So I think both 
uh, particularly the oral in terms of, you know, making it more palatable for patients and, and from a practical and tolerable sense as well compared to IV. They, they both potentially, in terms of efficacy and um, safety going forwards, um, they potentially offer a, a, a potential breakthrough really in type one narcolepsy uh, treatment going forwards. Because we're, like I uh, just mentioned, we're treating the underlying cause here as opposed to the, the weight promoting agents and the stimulants that we're using currently, which are predominantly just treating the, um, the, un, uh, the symptoms. So very lastly, looking at the other potential um, strategies that we might use. Um, so again, as, as Guy alluded to, we know that the um, researchers have long hypothesized and, and shown actually um, uh, time and again that type one narcolepsy is caused by an autoimmune process. Um, and uh, narcolepsy was uh, in the 90s first found to be associated with HLA. And as, as Guy alluded to, in, in 2010, the Pandemrix uh, H1N1 flu vaccine used in Northern Europe triggered uh, numerous cases of narcolepsy, further supporting an autoimmune trigger to, to the condition. So another potential approach um, and research avenue could be immune-based therapies administered at disease onset, which may slow down or stop the autoimmune process in its tracks. Um, whether, of course, immune-based therapy could be beneficial in type 1 narcolepsy remains, um, however, to be proven. And, of course, the safety aspect of such drugs would need to be considered. So to summarise, um, there are good conventional treatments that we use at the moment. However, there are issues regarding um, patients that remain intractable to these uh, treatments. And, of course, the tolerability going forwards with their with, um, with side effects and as well as um, comorbidities that might coexist with these patients and problems that they, these, uh, these coexisting conditions might uh, prove and uh, might pose rather in terms of uh, selecting uh, patients in terms of conventional treatment. And this is where the novel treatments uh, will come in, I think, um, and, and prove their worth. Um, and I think the future is ripe for research in terms of the novel under treating the novel underlying mechanisms. I'd like to thank you all for listening and once again thank you for the invitation. Thanks very much Jazz, uh, um, really excellent overview of some of the changes that have happened from a therapeutic perspective. Um, uh, this always gets people's blood pressure up um, be largely because of the, well two things, largely because of the um, lack of um, equality in terms of access to these drugs across the UK. Uh, uh, and also there is a, a, an additional problem in that, for example, patients with idiopathic hypersomnia don't, these drugs are, are not licensed for patients with IH, which creates access for, for these drugs. And I'm sort of paraphrasing a lot of the questions from people like uh, Matt Baker and um, uh, also, um, well, Kareem El, El, El Had, who also uh, has asked about whether why these drugs are so centralised. I wonder if if there's anything that you wanted to comment upon with regard to that. Regarding uh, the place of treatment, um, uh, sorry, these treatments in place of therapy well, well, regarding IH patients. Yeah, well, I think that and also what are the major obstacles to allowing these drugs being more widely used in, 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 in different centres? Yes. So, um, so... First of all, the, the lack of evidence uh, that is clear of these treatments in idiopathic hypersomnia. There was uh, data released, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, from Lumisemsku uh, from 2019. It was a two week uh, chart review, retrospective chart review of uh, patolescent uh, being used in um, IH patients. Uh, they did show uh, a significant improvement in uh, uh, symptoms. However, there was, I believe, there were only 38 patients in that study. And the, obviously the inherent weakness is a retrospective chart study has in itself. So as far as I'm aware, there's no randomized control trials in, in such a cohort. In terms of other, your second part of the question, so regarding the other centers using it. So the cost and local commissioning comes into play as well in, in terms of um, how we can use uh, novel treatments um, uh, that we are currently using at, at, at our center. Uh, for cases with IH. Um, I think, you know, with centres of uh, excellence up and down the country, I think with strong collaborative links with uh, commissioning groups, um, that could enable um, 
it to be used uh, on a you know on a non-formulary application basis um, with certain patients. Um, and certainly in clinical practice uh, at our sleep center, we've seen um, certain patients actually been uh, having their symptoms improved. Those are IH patients improved with with Tolton treatment uh, that we that we trialed in. Um, so I think with our center, I, I think um, uh, you know being one of um, many centers in the UK of uh, having that designated center of excellence, as it were. Um, I think with such strong collaborative links with the CCG, it makes it that much easier in terms of getting these into practice, into uh, uh, treating these uh, IH patients. But I think the lack of evidence uh, is a problem going forward. And I think that is an area ripe for research for the novel treatments. Well, thanks, Jazz. I'm afraid I've been given, given very stern instructions from the organisers <laughs> to say no more questions um, because uh, everybody needs a, a break before going to the keynote lecture, which is Walter Sorry. McNicholas I, I hope at 12.45. Um, we, we will try and answer some of your questions via, via um, uh, typing. So uh, apologies for that. But thank you very much. And we'll see you back here in uh, at 12.45. Thank, thank you very, very much, much. Gert Jan. Thank you very much, Jazz. Thank you, Guy.